As the Cold War intensified, sightings of UFOs became more frequent. Both the British and the American governments believed the Russians were developing weapons of mass destruction. Could these sightings be evidence of secret Russian technology or just Cold War paranoia? In a climate of fear, the West attempted to see through the Iron Curtain with the world's most powerful radio telescope at Jadro Bank. It is an amazing thing to reflect on that at that time, uh, the degree of technological knowledge in the Soviets of, of British and American state of technology and with us, the state of Soviet advance, was very small indeed. And I think this um, engendered a fear of, and a desire to look at the sky. And we, then, we then had enormous numbers of people in the world uh, gazing at the sky in a way they'd never done so before because they expected to see something to happen. In 1952, Britain's war leader, Winston Churchill, was re-elected. Seven years after World War II, he found himself leading in a different kind of era and facing the prospect of yet more conflict. The cabinet at that time were fully expecting that a third world war could occur at any moment. British policymakers and politicians, Churchill himself, were really worried that the Americans were so jittery that any incident could trigger this kind of transition to war. The threat soon seemed very real. It was reported that a swarm of UFOs had been sighted over Washington. The city was on high alert. Winston Churchill was forced to elevate the matter of flying saucers to the highest level. What does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. An event like this in Washington, which seems so extraordinary, is symptomatic of that level of nervousness in Washington at the time. <laughs> Fear of invasion was intensifying on both sides of the Atlantic. Sightings of strange lights and shapes in the sky were on the increase in Britain. Suspicious that the flying saucer sightings were actually new Soviet aircraft, Britain and America embarked on a top secret project to develop their own flying saucer. It was a seemingly impossible aircraft design, but the scientists were determined to bring the saucer to life. The flying saucer project was so important that the team worked for more than a decade to perfect its flight. Eventually, the U.S. Army pulled their funding from the project and grounded the saucer. But as science fact struggled with flying saucers, science fiction was fueling the imagination of the public for all things alien. You put a flag in the map and say, on this day, British Cold War science fiction culture took off, you would pick July 1953 and the first showing on British television of Quatermass, a BBC drama serial about a scientist fighting against alien invasion. Quatermass was a cultural event and people watched and they uh, saw a British scientist confronting aliens from another world and it was an electrifying experience. Just a few months after the Quatermass debut, a BBC television news report would cause controversy. The X-Files were about to become top secret. Flying officers Terry Johnson and Jeffrey Smythe had decided to go public with their UFO encounter. And could it have been uh, 
any sort of meteorological instrument or balloon? Well, I don't think so. We've gone into this business. We've argued out amongst ourselves, and we, we haven't yet arrived at any, anything conclusive. What did you think about this whole flying saucer story or this event? Well, after this, this time, I, I, I was a confirmed skeptic, but now I think I have an open mind. <laughs> Clear autumn day in November 1953, Smythe and Johnson's vampire jet had been cleared for takeoff from the RAF air base at West Malling in Kent. Their plan was to carry out a routine reconnaissance mission over southeast England. and the whole sighting is as clear in my mind's eye today as it was 50 years ago. We were flying at about 20,000 feet, daylight, late morning, absolutely clear sky, just like today, and uh, on practice interceptions, uh, we were over Kent, uh, I turned onto a northerly heading and saw this bright light, which I thought was a, a star or a planet, it was like a donut with the centre filled, but bright light around the donut area towards the periphery. I watched it for about 20 seconds. I gave Jeff a nudge. Well, I, I was operating the uh, radar, looking actually at nothing at all. I had nothing on the on the, on the tubes, um, and uh, this interruption. I, I was a bit annoyed actually because I it would interfere with my concentration. So I came from um, under the hood, if you like, and confirmed that there was something there. There was something there. And at that point, it sort of flew across to the right-hand side. It was something a bit odd. It was something very odd, which has never been proven to us either way, right or wrong. Smythe and Johnson's uh, sighting is to this day unexplained. It's another case where there was some corroborative evidence on uh, radar. Um, and, and these cases, well, in fact, there are, there are a whole string of them, um, you know, which have been going on from the 50s and indeed continue uh, to the current day. It was claimed that Smythe and Johnson's sighting had been confirmed by radar. As the 1950s wore on, radar reports of UFOs became more frequent. The new technology seemed to provide hard evidence for believers, while skeptics and the Ministry of Defense cited that the newness of the technology made it unreliable evidence. Back then, because it was so crude, and people didn't really know what all the signals they were receiving were, you ended up with spurious signals, you ended up with spoof signals based on atmospheric conditions, and at times you couldn't see the side of a house, and at other times you could. For want of a better thought, it might be something from outer space. When RAF officers Smythe and Johnson reported their own close encounter on the BBC, the government decided to act. There was a, an order that was sent out to all RAF stations basically saying that this subject, i.e. aerial phenomena, was something that should not be discussed in public by members of the armed forces and that by doing so they were in breach of the Official Secrets Act.